Thank you all so much for coming. And Kate, thank you for um, taking some time to build community in the way that you did by getting some introductions. It was um, really exciting to hear everyone and see everyone. And I am humbled by um, your support. I really do appreciate it. And also, it's really nice during a pandemic time when you're you know, living by yourself to um, uh, know that you've got community like this all, all around. So I really am so appreciative of you all being here today and talking about bounded justice, which I feel I've been talking about for so long. It's been in my head for um, ever since field work um, in Brazil, but I think it existed in my head way before. Um, and so we're just gonna like hop right into it since the intros took some time. And I'm okay with going a little bit over. So if you're able to stay a little bit over, um, also, if you could time check me, Kate, um, so that we have enough time for um, for questions. Uh, what, what, when would you like a note? Um, Maybe like 10 minutes of three? Yes, that'd be perfect. Cool. Um, okay, do, 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 share screen. You guys see my slides? Yes, we yes. see them in presenter mode though. How many times they give me talk? Oh, that's perfect. Okay, great. Can minimize this. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Also, feel free to tweet away. I'm at Melissa S. Creary. Um, so if something um, catches your eye, please feel free um, to put it out in the Twitter sphere, except for Paul, who's taking a Twitter break. I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and to be talking to you about Bounded Justice. Bounded Justice um, lived in a small section as part of a chapter in my dissertation on sickle cell disease policy development in Brazil. And I've been thinking about it and it has been evolving and continues to evolve as a concept and is finally about to be set free into the world. Um, I have been talking about Bounded Justice for a long time, but this is going to be a relatively new presentation that mimics the organization um, of the paper that will be coming um, out pretty soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, I gave a joke about uh, this presentation just consisting about uh, the quote from reviewer two. Uh, I decided to go against that and we're actually gonna have a proper presentation. So here's a roadmap for us. I'm gonna talk a little bit about positionality because I do find that um, taking ownership of your positionality, especially when you're attempting to be um, anti-racist and level setting about where you are, where your politics come from, how your scholarship has been developed is very important to the audience. Um, and I like to teach my students to question everything, to question the discipline, to question the authors, to find out where they're from, to find out what their discipline is. And so I'm giving you some of that background as part of this. Um, I'll be setting up Bounded Justice with a little bit of background, and then um, we'll talk about Bounded Justice as a concept, Bounded Justice as a conceptual framework, Bounded Justice as a diagnostic using two contemporary cases, but very briefly, and then we'll have time for some discussion. Um, and you can see on the slide here, a very varied and um, uh, uh, non-linear um, path uh, in which I, um, you heard about um, via Kate's introduction, so I won't go uh, into that. Um, other than to say um, that it's important to talk about who you are, I think. So I'm one slide behind on mine. This is what I was referring to when I was talking about me. So I'm an SCS scholar um, at a school of public health and value the methodologies of ethnography and oral history. Uh, before I be became that scholar, I was constantly playing the role of insider and outsider, someone 
living with sickle cell disease while also being part of the public health apparatus at CDC that was creating policy at different levels for the sickle cell disease community. When I lived in Brazil, bounded justice was made crystal clear as I witnessed activists interact with governmental elites. I wore both of these hats and came to understand how even I contributed to bounded justice. As a professor invested in health equity and anti-racist teaching and research, I wanted to question everything, including disciplinary norms and assumptions, even if that meant pushing back on the processes of health equity. So it's important that we start out with knowing what sickle cell is, but also why I think it's important. Most of my work uses sickle cell disease as a lens to tell a broader story about policy development and attempts to achieve equity. Studying the mechanisms of Brazil's police development and the contemporary implications for those living with sickle cell disease not only provides us with a case study of bounded justice as a concept and conceptual framework, but also sheds new light on the phenomenon of policy development itself. So social health movements in Brazil for sickle cell disease and other racialized disorders have a fairly recent history um, which led to policy change on the national level. The Brazilian state created the national health policy for the black population in 2006 to establish equity as a necessary precondition for the fulfillment of equality. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about the nuance of equity versus equality. But what's important here is that we've got a national health a national policy for the black population that this population has been described as vulnerable. It's important to know who described it. And I think that uh, that vulnerability came from inside social movements um, and then was attached to those in the, the public health apparatus to again, construct what a vulnerable population would be for this, for this disease, um, sickle cell. Um, and this was done through policy development processes that were embedded in the Brazilian constitution of 1988. The accompanying and newly reformed healthcare system was predicated on the need for increased community participation in the political processes of health policy. It prioritized the social rights of its citizens and called for co-management of municipal, state, and federal government. Yet, despite this mandate for citizen participation, the justice-based health policy as described is unable to address the underlying mechanisms that generated initial inequalities. So um, what you see here is um, a schema of how the constitution was supposed to actually embed social participation. And this came again through national health conferences, national health councils, and trickled down such so, so at all levels on the municipal, state, and federal levels um, had a mandatory community participation aspect in the creation of policy, the evaluation of policy. And so these things are good. These types of processes are, are great for establishing how equity may work. So we have folks with sickle cell coming to the table and I have here um, this is a symposium um, in Salvador, and I have um, friends and colleagues that are literally around the table discussing sickle cell disease from a medical aspect, a political aspect, a social aspect. And um, there was a constitutional mandate for inclusion in policy, but I argue a lack of recognition for the ways in which the bodies invited to the proverbial table historically embodied social exclusion. So what brought them to the table to begin with? In essence, these attempts at equity, even while operating in a health system that is based on universal health care, they are bounded by larger societal, systemic, and structural factors. Bounded justice challenges the idea that health equity is an achievable goal, given that all other factors will be equal. So then let's talk about what equity is. Equity means social justice or fairness, um, and, and bounded justice is an ethical is an ethical concept, but equity too is an ethical concept grounded in principles of distributive justice. And for health purposes, uh, distributive justice denotes a just distribution of resources according to the needs of the population. And we come to this understanding 
through this idea of vertical equity. So there's horizontal equity and there's vertical equity. And in terms of how most people envision how equity is deployed, most of us envision around it around equality of outcome. So people are treated differently according to their initial endowments, resources, privileges, or rights. And what you see on the other side of this slide will become a little bit more apparent right now, it's without context, but these are some crates that have been stacked on each other. So think about how um, equity is envisioned and know that both of these functions of equity and processes of equity are aspirational. So then that leads us to the definition of bounded justice. Bounded justice suggests that it is impossible to attend to fairness, the entitlement that may come down from state, um, the state and equity when the basic, um, and equity when the basic social and physical infrastructures underlying them have been eroded by racism and other historically entrenched isms. So I'm going to go through part one, bounded justice as a concept, part two, bounded justice as a conceptual framework, and part three, bounded justice as a diagnostic. So what makes a concept a concept? So I refer to two um, references, Gehring and Jabberini. And Gehring says a good concept has familiarity, resonance, coherence, differentiation, depth, theoretical utility, and field utility. And Jabberin says every concept has a history, contains components originating from other concepts and relate back to other concepts. So there's a back and forth that play. And in fact, bounded justice does indeed have a history the chronology of its origins for the purposes of this paper occur alongside the redesign of the Brazilian constitution in 1988, though it is safe to assume that bounded justice has enacted itself in many instances in differing socio-historic contexts and temporally before the redemocratization of Brazil. Furthermore, this concept is connected to and problematizes well-developed concepts of justice including aspects of distributive justice, restorative justice, and social justice. I won't be able to go into these specifics um, for the sake of time, but you can check it out soon when this paper comes out. So in this portion of the presentation, I'll go over how bounded justice came to be a historical con in, in a historical context. Um, sanitaristas, or physicians who were part of a movement to address equity, were embedded in the government and helped with the creation of SUS, which, and SUS is the public health system in Brazil, in 1988. And, um, and so I have here a schematic that shows um, the policy processes that I talked about earlier but in context with history, right? So we have this new constitution that happens in 1988. We have a brand new healthcare, universal healthcare system that's created as a result of that. And those things are then embedded in terms of um, the new policy practices that, that are um, pushed down for policy development and community participation. But this is also in context with a military regime and dictatorship and opening of a Brazilian government um, the relaxing of, of rules in general across society and black movement becoming stronger, healthcare movements becoming stronger, basically all activists being able to find their voice again once the opening of the government takes place. And all of this converges in the national health black policy that's, um, that's written in 2009. So if we turn our attention to the timeline in the slide, it starts at 1964 to help prevent context, but way off the timeline is a long history of colonization, slavery, and oppression. And the 2009 policy is an attempt to address this. And so here we have text from the policy itself. The text of the policy for Black population health begins with guiding principles. This policy is grounded in constitutional principles of citizenship and human dignity, the rejection of racism and equality. With these principles are the joining of popular participation and social control, key tools for the formulation, implementation, evaluation, and possible redirection of public health policies. 
these are the developments of um, the principle of community participation. So Brazil's constitution was rewritten in 1988, and two years later, an emphasis for community par participation was added and made law. This policy drafted in 2006 is reminding us of the commitment already made from 1988. And we can see that it links the policy back to tenants written throughout the relatively new constitution of 1988 through the notions of citizenship, rejection of racism, equality, and reinforced by the notion of social control via community participation. So this slide depicts an image from the eighth national health conference in 1986, which urged for health reform and the development of a new public health system based on, again, universality, completeness, and equity. And then fast forward to 2009 um, and beyond where the tenants have been translated into that national black health policy. And um, there were stickers and posters and uh, on cars, on walls, this, this slogan that said racial equality in our public health system is for real. So the new healthcare system was predicated on the need for increased community participation in the political processes of health policy. It prioritized the social rights of its citizens and called for co-management, again, municipal, state, and federal government. And so this is what they refer to as control social or social control. And this terminology may seem counterintuitive, this idea of social control, as one may assume that it's the government who is attempting to control the political processes for health. But in fact, it mandates that members of the community are directly involved with the creation, implementation, and evaluation of these policies. And this model came out of the work of two groups, socially mobilized citizens who were distrustful of an authoritarian regime, and a group of more elite health reformers bent on addressing Brazil's inequities. So when we think about these elite health reformers, again, think about the positionalities that they may have held. And so some of you may be familiar with this graphic that's meant to illustrate the difference between equality and equity where three individuals of varying heights stand in front of a fence on either same size crates which means that only the tallest of the three can see over the fence. This is depicting equality. And on the equity side are stacked crates so that they can each look over the fence at the same height. And we, the interpreter, are to liken the crates to some type of resource, right? Money, personnel, better access, better opportunity, policy. And the more crates, the more we are to assume resources. So as a visual reminder of this distribution of resources, the individual is elevated by standing on the increasing crates. This is a representation of vertical equity, an attempt to achieve an equal outcome in which people are treated differently according to their initial endowments, resources, privileges, or rights. And so there have been some critiques and adjustments to that image. Some of you may have also seen this image. Um, and it's been said that the previous one have, does not depict reality, that this might be a better visual. And the concept of down to justice critiques the vertical processes of distributing justice and equity and suggests that they do not go deep enough. Distributive justice is a tiered process that assumes that the intended recipient, recipient is able to adequately and efficiently accept and properly retain the benefits of justice. Equity in health is not is an ethical value normative in theory, but also fails, but often fails to structure practice. Health equity is an ideal and a policy goal, but the justice that practitioners seek is often imagined unrealistically. When populations, I'm sorry, when programs are narrowly constructed to benefit marginalized populations without redressing the cumulative effects of disadvantage, the results constitute a bounded justice. So in this picture, what's denoted here is reality is that there is no level playing field to begin with, that people are actually in the ground. And some people are given so many crates that they have much more than they will ever need. Um, and then this idea of liberation is, a, um, is another um, aspect we need to remove uh, the systemic pieces so that everyone can see the thing that we want them to see, have access to the thing that we want them to have access to. 
And then we have this one, and I have to um, uh, thank Paul Fleming, who uh, both he, Rihanna, and William Lopez were on a 24-7 group chat all the time, and we're sharing texts, and we're sharing articles, and we're sharing thoughts, and, and uh, really, they sustain my energy around wanting to burn it all down. Uh, but more importantly, for the purposes of this, of this talk, I got this um, image. Um, and here is yet another depiction of equality versus equity and how crates may be manipulated. And so portrayed are three people of equal stature experiencing external forces that distort how tall they are. This image reveals biased foundational beliefs about innate differences in value or merit that often undermine the success of equity-based interventions. Okay, so this is yet another level of how equity and the distribution of equity gets bounded, even with best intentions. And so as 2021 begins, it's in the rear view mirror, um, in its rear view mirror is a legacy and ongoing fallout of, pan of a pandemic that has exacerbated deep structural inequities merged with a national reckoning of racial injustice and calls for justice often intertwined, right, with the narratives of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they have become more frequent and more urgent. And bounded justice as a concept necessarily critiques not only these tangential and emerging conceptions of justice, but may aid in problematizing the established justice discourse as well. Sydney's on this call, and I have talked about bounded justice with Sydney for so long, and it is in fact, even though she has allowed me to claim it, this has actually come from, from, um, from Sydney. Um, inclusion is a political performance of the present meant to remedy a diagnosis that is both historical and embodied. The design for, of policy for Brazil serves as a cautionary tale for the newfound focus on addressing racism as a public health issue. In Brazil, the provisions for justice set forth by the Constitution and contemporary distributed were limited by larger systemic forces. While the policy produced political optimism and excellent optics for the government, once implemented, it reified biological notions of race, was chronically underfunded, and failed to substantively engage with community stakeholders. And so Rawls' theory of justice as fairness describes a society of free citizens holding equal basic rights and cooperating within an egalitarian economic system. It is about how people are treated and how decisions are made. And while Rawls' theory of justice as fairness does not address health specifically, justice is central to the mission of public health through health improvement for the population and fair treatment to the disadvantaged. An underlying value and principle of health equity is that health differences adversely affecting socially disadvantaged groups are particularly unacceptable because ill health can be an, obs an obstacle to overcoming social disadvantage, which suggests that need should be a key determinant of resource allocation for health. So then let's switch gears to bounded justice as a conceptual framework. Um, which I won't spend a whole lot of time on, um, but I do wanna offer again, Jabberine's words of what makes a conceptual framework. A network of interlinked concepts that together provide a comprehensive understanding of a phenomenon or phenomena. Um, also not merely collections of concepts, but rather constructs in which each concept plays an integral role. And so um, bounded justice is inherently linked to a number of concepts that addresses the entanglements of justice, inclusion, and citizenship for vulnerable populations. Here are some. Um, bounded justice is created in concert with both well-established and novel schemas like structural violence, ecological frameworks of health, intersectionality, embodiment, biocultural citizenship, um, and social exclusion. Each of these offer distinct ways to help conceptualize how deployed justice tax tactics fall short while also working together to help explain larger societal phenomena and the ways that health happens. And each further contribute to the ways that we value or don't value 
lived experience in the explanation of health outcomes, policy development, and interventional design. Um, and so when we're thinking about this holistic um, way of being and health, obviously we have to give thanks to the ecological framework and Mama Krieger, the goddess of all things public health. Uh, we have a running joke about Mama Krieger in our in our group chat, um, but we uh, she is she is there and present because of the things that she makes very clear, not just to us but to many um, who are in public health and outside of public health. And here is one of her um, um, schematics around um, the ecology uh, of health and how racism and health are intersected. Um, across the life course and through various number of pathways. So even if we are being intentional and well-intentioned about addressing social justice and health, the depth of intersecting oppressions that have been embodied since before one's, one was even born um, is bound to undermine the impact. Understanding how personal, situational, and socio-cultural factors such as racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia intersect has far reaching implications for policy development, knowledge production, and the design of interventions. And so these are the things that we have to contend with when we're thinking about how we're developing policies, technologies, interventions for the so-called vulnerable and marginalized. This uh, unequal access to goods and services, differentiated access to income and educational potential, economic divestment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so some scholars have linked social exclusion to inadequate social participation, lack of social integration, and lack of power resulting in unequal resources, reduced capabilities, and fewer claims on human rights. The concept has spread around the world, particularly in Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Canada. And in fact, um, uh, I provided text from a Canadian epidemiologist article on social exclusion to a designer to help them create this image. Um, uh, Dr. Labat in, in Canada um, has written extensively on social exclusion and I turned to him to help me um, make sense of how social exclusion and inclusion really work together or against each other. And um, so this was based off of a cartoon in one of his articles that I couldn't find. It was a New Zealand cartoon. And so I, I, um, I commissioned a graphic artist to create this for me to give, to give the same sense. And even though in the original graphic, there were two humans in, a, um, uh, in the ring, one was meant to be more aristocratic and one was meant to be more the layman depicted a, a poorer person. Um, she was like, what if we turned that person, not into a person, but an animal? And here we can see when we're talking about this should be a good match, they're playing on the same level. Uh, they're playing a, you know, on a level playing field. And, and we make this very in your face for, okay, if all things are being equal, we're still not matched quite correctly for a fair fight. Uh, here is a being that was born um, into a particular, um, epigenetic framework, if you will, where they are prepared for protection and life and resource gathering in a way in which the other is not. So this is just something to help us think through when we're, when we're thinking about the fact that we have got um, someone who is included because maybe they're forcing their way through it, or maybe they've been given all of the things in birthright in order to be included versus others. So this same epidemiologist asks, how can one include people and groups into structured systems that have systematically excluded them in the first place? And while the United States has not taken up this exact concept in theory or practice as much as other regions, it has embraced other related concepts such as poverty and social capital. And further, as much as the US may not have implemented social exclusion, as a guiding tenet for policy, it has captured wholeheartedly the concept of inclusion. So what does it mean when you're trying to do the right thing and make sure you're inclusive? In this time when we are now turning to work groups and task forces, how do we position people to have power once they are 
around the table. We often think about inclusion in a vacuum and not as a fraction of the whole picture. We cannot then think about inclusion without interrogating exclusion. Social exclusion defines disadvantage as an outcome of social processes instead of assigning it as characteristics of any one group. Social exclusion is a product of people's relationships with the labor market, consumptions, institutions, social relationships, culture, and geographical space. In public health, we recognize this as an ecological framework to health and the basis of epigenetics. If we are prompted to design more pathways of inclusion due to the indignities of society and as a form of justice, we are also forced to reckon with the ways in which embodied exclusion will affect the efficaciousness of, this, of these designs. And so here I have um, just highlighted a small portion of a recent article that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine during um, sickle cell being September, um, September being sickle cell awareness month. And there was this editorial about racism and sickle cell disease. And of course, how we have here include patients with sickle cell disease um, or their advocates on anti-racism task forces. Some of you on this call know how I feel about task forces and work groups um, and this notion of bringing people to the table. And then I offer this um, beautiful art piece. How, how simple is it to just scoop this chair up and sit at the table? This is what I feel like we're sometimes working with, an invitation and then how exactly am I supposed to fit in? How exactly do I um, make my voice heard? How do I even sit in this thing? And so I, I gave a talk to the Ingham County Department of Health recently, and I just was, um, it was about the newly formed racism as a public health issue and people bringing, bringing it to light and trying to make it a real thing. And in my research for that presentation, I found um, this quote from Chairperson Brian Crenshaw added, Ingham County is showing its commitment to address racism in the county by declaring racism as a public health crisis and establishing the task force. We are looking to hear voices of our employees and county residents on how we can move forward and address this creating an as equal playing field for all residents. And here we go with the equal playing field. And here we go with another task force. And are we asking the questions we're supposed to ask? Are we understanding that by asking them to come to the table, we also have to ask them to bring all of their baggage and address all of their baggage? So then let's return to the case of Brazil. We see that despite the constitutional mandate for community participation, vis-a-vis -vis inclusion in policy development and evaluation, historically marginalized citizens still lacked power and capital and therefore were not seen as legitimate participants. So there are two sides working in conjunction to produce bounded justice. On the one side is a powerful state that outside of a legislative mandate to address inequality, is not interested in redistributing power. On the other are the descendants of a population who have had their legal, economic, and general human rights historically denied, but have contemporarily been given political power in the absence of other important pieces of power. The new Brazilian constitution of 1988 was aspirationally drafted by individuals embedded in the health reform movement and hopeful for its potential to enact change on the ground level. The legacies of elitism and white supremacy within the public health apparatus were stronger than the justice-based origins of equity building by embedded activists. So I have posed bounded justice as a concept and conceptual framework, um, both of which can have methodological assumptions that can tell us about the real world. How could bounded justice be used as a potential analytical tool both the optics and reality of social justice and health or equity are appealing. Those not concerned beyond the performativity of justice want to appear to have made at least superficial efforts. And those with actual investment are propelled much like the Santa Teresa's of Brazil by the call to address both historical and current inequities. Both can potentially do more damage than intended neither will be able to completely deliver the justice that they claim. So there is a need for a diagnostic and eventual praxis involving the continual interplay between reflection and action. 
to help those who want to endeavor into practices of justice or for those who want to elevate the actions of others who promise the delivery of justice. Uh, and so here I, um, I have put this young man on a crate or two. Will this help him? Will the justice that we create vis-a-vis -vis the resources that we have just thrown at him give him the fair fight that we've been looking for? I say nay. So that's very, why, Melissa, it's 2.50. It's 2.50. Oh, no. 2.49, 2.49, 11 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, go. OK, so I don't really have time to go over these two contemporary um, cases then. Um, but what I but what I would um, like to say, let's see, do, 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 contemporary case studies. Let me quickly, quickly go through um, what I'm trying to get at here. So basically COVID-19 and scar tissue, what I'm trying to get at here is we have this moment in time, we have a White House Coronavirus Task Force. They have declared the disproportionate impact um, and, and um, they have talked about all of these things that are underlying what has happened early in the pandemic in black and brown people. And uh, Paul Fung and I have written an opinion piece that basically says it's not about race, it's about racism, right? And that what truly underlies this narrative are structural inequities. And so what I go on in the paper is to make this link between COVID-19 and what happened with Freddie Gray's um, death and the response to it in Baltimore um, in 2015. And along with it was uh, this influx of money and a response from the Obama White House and um, uh, programs and policies and everything was being um, thrown at this problem of how do we, how do we fix um, all the things that, that are leading to it. And the, um, at the time, Elijah Cummings was like, there was just, we weren't able to do it because there was just too much scar tissue. Um, there's a, there's a quote here, um, deep distrust of institutions, unstable political leadership, and the intractable barriers erected by generations of poverty, segregation, and disinvestment. There was just too much scar tissue. And so I, I talk about this um, metaphorical scar tissue um, as the obstacle to justice delivery system um, and the way that we're thinking about distribution of resources when it comes to COVID-19 and when it certainly comes to vaccine um, development and dissemination. Also in the, in the paper, I talk about this constant quest for equity. We're, we're in the sickle cell world, we've been saying the same things over and over again, fighting the same battle over and over again. So the same thing that we're saying in 1970 about how there's this disparity between cystic fibrosis and sickle cell is the same exact thing that gets brought up in this study, the consensus study report in 2020. And shout out to Daniel for bringing this to my attention um, when it first came out. Um, and so I talk about this enduring cycle of recognition a struggle and struggle for recognition and advancement um, and how basically um, that when efforts are duplicated and, and short memories are, are alive and well, little action and, and there's no sustainability that this too is a form of bounded justice. And then I will leave us with hot off the press and again from the fire work group chat um, this brand new piece that just um, came out, Dreams of a Beloved Public Health, Confronting White Supremacy in Our Field. Um, I read it. I recommend that we all read it. It's a scorching um, analysis of how we need to go beyond uh, this idea of saying that health equity is something to be achieved and how that is tied with white supremacist um, viewpoints. And so I will end in that there is a lot that I think that Founded Justice can offer us, that um, I see it as an eventual evaluative tool with more research and an eventual praxis. 
Um, it can provide guidance for responsible and more effective inclusion, can evaluate entitlement processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can change the world, she says, but not really, because it's a very long process equi of equity building. And that's part of it is not understanding exactly what um, it takes to build in the processes to attain the equity. And I will stop here, not a lot of minutes, but anyone who's willing to stay on, I am willing to stay on as well. I appreciate your attention thus far. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm happy Can I to- ask a question? Of course. Sorry, I just thought we have limited time. I saw a few hands go up. All right, here's my, my question. First of all, thank you for outlining this. And it's exciting to see this concept continue to develop over, over time and the, the different ways you've been developing it. I, I read the piece, I think it was in the Atlantic, I can't remember where it was, that was kind of talking about how we're, we're seeing more and more uh, discussion of equity and justice inside of organizations and inside of companies, corporations, et cetera and sort of how it's being used in appropriate ways and how it's some, in some cases being used to kind of not address things in the way that, that some of these frameworks and theoretical models are, are sort of best practice approaches. And I wonder what your thoughts are on, on what aspects of bounded justice or, or some of what you've been working on could speak to, you know, helping these kinds of organizations address this in a way that doesn't dilute or, or somehow prevent uh, uh, progress? Yes, so I, I think that's where I'm getting at with, um, with the eventual praxis and the tool. I, I envision that bounded justice um, is, a, is on a spectrum, right? And there's a way to unbind it and uh, and we should assume that all aspects of the things that we develop are going to be bounded because society is naturally going to um, provide that, that binding agent. And so then the idea is how good do we get at loosening the boundedness, I guess, um, of, of the justice. And what I envision is that there are a number of questions um, uh, you know, you add in you add in your answers to um, a particular every every situation will change because every situation will be specifically tailored for what's going on. But that there's some sort of evaluation that happens on the top end. You put in your info, and then not that you like spit out a score, a bounded justice score necessarily, but but that there is a way for for people to 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 be critically thinking about okay, this is our attempt, this is what we're aiming to do, this is how we're going to fall short. And then it's always about backwards planning. So I think sound justice is uh, about recognizing that you're going to fall short no matter what, and then backwards plan. Um, and I think the reflection piece really is key because reflection really is at the core of anti-racist pedagogy and anti-racist research, right? So it's about, asking some of those hard questions that come with that reflection process. Um, so I don't have a, a standard answer, but I do think that boundary justice can offer 100% a model to how we critically think about the AI, how we critically think about doing more than just making lip service. I mean, if we, how many times do we have to turn on the radio and how many times have you heard equity, inclusion, equity, inclusion, equity, inclusion, right? And, and what does it mean to actually try and um, create the spaces where equity and inclusion are are done meaningfully? Um, and we're and we're and I'm afraid that anti-racism is going to get to the same place where DEI is right now, right? DEI people kind of roll their eyes, and now the term du jour is anti-racism. Um, so I think it's up to all of us to hold tight to make sure that it doesn't get to that. But I do think that with further research and further interrogation and further work to create an evaluative tool that the family justice can definitely offer something. Thank I think Amel was the next person who had their hand up. Thanks. 
Thanks so much for this presentation, Melissa. This was amazing. Um, and I was so glad to learn more about your work. Um, I think my question kind of builds on these concepts that uh, you were talking about with Michael. Um, throughout your presentation, I was kind of thinking about the assignment that we asked our students to do last semester, evaluating their COVID response of different states. And so many of them reported that their states were fully capable of identifying and reporting racial and ethnic disparities, and yet had very little in the way of programs that were even attempting to address those disparities. And some states that did have programs really tried to sidestep the racial inequity and said, well, we want to do socioeconomic programs and hope that kind of gets at the racial inequity. And it got me thinking, I think that I want to know what you think about that in general, but I also, it got me thinking that perhaps states and governments have a sense of impossibility around addressing racial inequity and they feel that those inequity, those numbers are always going to come back the same. So it kind of allows them to think, well, I don't have to try to address them because it's impossible and we'll always have those same numbers. So I don't have to go for that vertical equity that's an outcomes-based equity. Um, does that, I hope that made sense and I wanted to see what she thought about that. Let me, let me try and make sense of it. You're saying that it's easy for maybe a state health department to say that we're never gonna be able to get to, to equity of outcome, um, that this number is always gonna look the same? Yeah, and that maybe that's like, a, maybe that's part of why they don't do as, maybe that's part of why we didn't see as many states institute programs to actually address the racial and ethnic disparities in COVID. I see, I see. Well, I do, so I would say that I think that I think that it takes a long time for people to one, wrap their head around um, things <laughs> in a pandemic, two, two to then actually actually do. I, rem I remember when Ingham County asked me to speak specifically about what are our next steps? How can we actually adhere to racism as a public health issue and take the concerns and take the data and do something. And they were totally overwhelmed um, by a number of factors. One, they knew they didn't have the trust that they needed in the community. Two, I think um, they didn't know what exactly to do with, um, with the data. Um, I have mentioned before how data can be weaponized, and I think that these people were very conscious of not doing that, but they, they, also, they were also in this insular little group, right? So the folks who are announcing that, policy, that racism is a public health issue, you know, these are the commissioners, these are the people who like are in front of the cameras, who maybe not, don't have skin in the game. Um, and then it's up to these people who are, again, like the San Teresas, embedded in certain pockets to then take it and uplift it and do something meaningful with it. And I think that there's some real tension there because not everyone is as invested. Some are invested in it being just lip service. So then, so then you have to get past, you know, the political buy-in of actually convincing that we have to do something beyond just saying something for the sake of saying something that might look like engaging community. Okay, will the community eviscerate you? Or we do another task force. We do another work group. We invite people to come again to the proverbial table, but then are we actually listening? Are we actually, um, the things that, I, that, I, that I've just said, right? Like how, how are we um, bringing all that, they're, that they have to this table to then take that and make it into an actionable item for programs? And I think all those things take time. So that might explain why nothing had happened yet, according to what our students were reporting. Um, also, it's hard. It's hard. And I think a lot of people are like, let's, let's do the bare minimum for now. So one of the things I push back on is this acute space where we have to do something now. And that has to be coupled with the chronic space, which is long in, and embedded and takes the, the length of time that we know it's going to take because it's not, building equity is not a process that can happen in a number of years. And it's also why 
you know, when we try to attach these equity projects to NIH grants and they want to see something in two to three years, it's like, it's going to take me that long to build relationship <laughs> to, 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 you know, to get to the equity outcomes that you want me to, that you want me to measure. So it's all built in sy systemically um, and we need to like break it all down, um, you know, so that's another soapbox, but you're asking about, <laughs> you're asking about um, the specifics of, of, of why it may not happen. And that may be why, because acute things need to happen. The acute things may not be so meaningful. We forget or, or we just want to shy away from the long-term stuff and we can't, but we do. That makes sense. Did I see a question from Marin? I guess I'll ask one, Melissa, if okay. Um, as you may know, so yeah, of course. the state with the state of Michigan and vaccination, just because the state of Michigan is the one I know best. So previously, it seemed like the state, maybe unofficially at least, was distributing vaccinations on the basis of who could get them out the door fastest. Mm -hmm. And under that schema, Michigan Medicine was receiving about 11,000 vaccinations a month at its peak. So the state of Michigan just last week decided to adopt the CDC social vulnerability index in distribution. So Michigan Medicine received about 400 last week. And theoretically, the bulk of the distribution is going to communities harder hit by COVID. But it seems to me that this um, might really suffer from some of the points that you're making that like, just because they have vaccinations doesn't make them like the system safer. I was just wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your theory in this context. Right. So I, um, they just recently, um, they just recently produced a Academies of Science big, thick booklet on how to uh, do vaccines equitably. And um, I really, want to give that a more in-depth read. All of that to say, you know, I have ideas, but they're not super informed. <laughs> um, I think that, I would argue they're extraordinarily informed. Maybe you just focus on a slightly different topic, <laughs> but don't sell yourself short. I assure you they're more informed than many of the decision makers. <laughs> but like, if we think about bounded justice in the, um, in the, in this context of like, vulnerability. Um, I, I think it's so important, right, to the point of we have to, we have to attack things quickly. We have to make it, we have to make a difference. We, um, uh, from a medical, from a medical standpoint, we have to um, think about equity and what we know in the equity space is that vulnerable and marginalized populations aren't getting vaccinated on, at the same level, at the same rate than the white counterparts. Um, but then we, I was having a conversation, so there are lots of things going on in my mind right now. One is I think it's easy, I think it's easy right now for this to be a scapegoat conversation. I think it's easy right now for people to say, well, there's so much distrust in the healthcare system by black and brown people anyway, that this makes sense. No, of course they're not gonna be vaccinated at the same rate because of all the things that we know about um, the communities and how they may or may not interact with the healthcare system or may or may not trust the production of the vaccine um, in general, even if it has nothing to do with the healthcare system, but the clinical trial apparatus, the research apparatus in general. Um, so, so, so there's that. So then, so then it's about how do we earn the trust to get those numbers up? That's number one. Um, number two, I think that when we're thinking about the disproportionate rate of folks who are not um, getting, and then this this push um, that we just have to couple that push with all the things that we know will bring them the best that they can, give them the crates the best that they can, understanding 
that in the giving of the crates and the building and the building of their, you know, let allowing them to 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 um, gain greater access, that that has to happen in addition to other things. That it has to happen. That it has to involve maybe ongoing education as opposed to here's just a, a pamphlet. Um, that that there are community aspects that are involved that don't just include standing in the line in the hospital and getting a shot in the arm and that's it. I I just I think that um, if we're going to do this right in terms of a targeted um, a targeted push, we have to do it in such a way that the black or brown population is like, but why are you guys so pressed? Why are you so pressed to get that thing in my arm in the first place when um, you know, when I come to the healthcare system any other way, I'm pushed away. When I come to the healthcare system in all other ways, um, I'm treated poorly. When I, you know, like, so why are you so pressed to do right by me now? Um, so I think that there has to be like this overarching conversation um, that involves generations long <laughs> conversations of how we can make the system um, palatable for people. How we can't just we can't just flip a switch and be like, now we want equity. Um, uh, we we have to understand that there that I you may want equity and you may you may you may have the greatest intention, um, but as Bounded Justice explains, that's the tip of the iceberg. How I've been dealing with systemic hypervigilance and I've been dealing with, you know, my people being incarcerated. I've been dealing with not enough resources. I've been dealing with, I have to, I'm the one on the line. I'm the one on the line and you supposedly care about me, but you haven't shown how you cared about me in any other way. Not just in the healthcare system, but throughout the life course of my life. You haven't shown that you care about me in any other way. Thank you for coming, Katie. So that's a long-winded answer to that. No, that was great. It's sort of like filling the crates with vaccines doesn't really do us any good, right? <laughs> um, it looks like Sunny had maybe the last question. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I realize we're over time, um, but I'm, I'm, and thank I just you really appreciate you taking so much. I appreciate you taking the time to, to present. Um, I just had a quick question. I think I, I saw the picture of the chair that you showed with, you know, that ridiculous chair. And it, it, it struck me because I've seen that chair. I've been offered that chair. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have any advice for people, especially um, I'm, I'm new to academia and just starting my you know, career. But um, how do we approach that chair in a way that is effective? And um, yeah, I mean, I don't. It doesn't involve contortion, right? It, exactly. And that's exactly it. It's like, how much do we, you know, what you said about bringing our own baggage and everything into that space well they're not allowing for that and right. so it's either a choice of do you accept it and and try to right contort yourself to fit whatever system or expectations um in the in the small chance that you can actually make a change or how how do we how do we call attention to that chair i think that image was just so strong and i don't know if you have any advice for for folks who are trying to to I make a change I I commend you. I am one of those people. I've been offered that chair. I'm sure there are many people on this call that have been offered that chair. Um, and the thing is, it's like you, you think, okay, well, it's at least it's a seat at the table. So I will contort myself, but then your back gets broken. And it, like you're uncomfortable. You gotta, you gotta eventually leave the table because you're like, I can't do this. Um, and this is how we leave this is what happens to people of color in the academy. This is why folks leave. This is um, this is why this is why at least you know when I'm thinking about the cycle um, and how things get pushed and then pulled back up for priorities and then pushed down. That's because this chair, like no one's effectively doing anything because either you can't sit in it or you sit in it and you have to leave. There's no longevity. Um, so I guess what I would say is burn the chair down, 
<laughs> but that's because I want to burn everything down. <laughs> um, I would say that I, you know, part of um, I'm part of this collective in which I um, I met Esther, and we changed we changed the 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 tag name to we don't want to sit at the table, we want to own the table. And so the name of our group chat is owning the table. And um, I think that that's, those are the mechanisms that have to take place. You start to get the interlocutors and you start to find out, okay, it's not about the chair. It's about this larger systemic thing. And maybe it's the table. So let's find out about what it, we need to do to gain ownership of the table. And then we can fix the chairs later. You know, like we want equity, like equity in real estate equity. <laughs> also the other kind of equity, but <laughs> that equity too. So I, you know, I would just say solidarity that this is not, it's not an easy road to be invited to the table when you know that things are stacked against you, when you know that the um, cultural capital is not a match, the social capital is not a match, the political capital is not a match. And it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how many degrees you have sometimes. It doesn't matter how much experience you have sometimes. Um, I think I would say, do it until you're tired. Take a break. And if you can come back, come back. If you can't come back, is everyone's loss, but whatever you need to do to make sure that your back isn't broken is what you need to do. I think that those are amazing last words to a really incredible talk. And I know I speak on behalf of all of us when I say thank you so much, Melissa, this was excellent. And thank we cannot so wait much. to read the whole piece. I'm so sorry that I uh, did not finish the two the two pieces. The two pieces are like, wah! But yes, you can read it or there can be, or maybe I'll have a part two. You guys can just come and hear me talk about it for fun. And this, You need to is, stop attracting so many people to your talks. <laughs> <laughs> when is we the paper coming to, out and where can we find it? We need to do it over happy hour. It It is in currently in revise, what is it? Revise and resubmit land. Um, but I will shout it to the rooftops because I am a slow thinker and a slow writer, much to the chagrin of the School of Public Health. <laughs> but it's coming out and I'm very proud of it. And, it, and I will thorough and thoughtful, thank you Paige. Um, but it will, as soon as it comes out. Um, and every time I talk about it, people are like, oh, where's this paper? And I'm like, what? You want me to write? Do you understand how painful writing is? <laughs> Again, things they don't care about when you're on the tenure track. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, slow and steady wins the race. Thorough and thoughtful is part of the game. And so um, it is, it's coming and um, I will let everybody know. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.